thank you very much to India Design for inviting me here. It's been an absolute pleasure to discover the city and all the amazing local design presented here. Yeah, so I was thinking about what I would talk about here um, today and realized I can probably best discuss the topic that I am most passionate about um, and the reason why I'm a designer and um, why I continue to be a designer, which is my fascination for materials and how to manipulate them um, in order to create my designs. So yeah, I will be talking about how I have been working with materials in the past and how I am working with materials currently and how I want to be working with materials in the future. So um, maybe a little bit about myself. Uh, so I am a designer based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And yeah, I love materials, especially understanding what you can do with materials and how they behave uh, in combination with light um, and the production process, how you can sort of keep getting more from a material than what it begins with. So yeah, material as inspiration. I'm definitely not the type of designer that sits down and makes a sketch and then figures out how to make that design. It's much more the other way around. Um, I like to play with materials, analyze, and then figure out what form or shape that should get in order to highlight the material properties that I'm really interested in. So zooming in on the cast resins, it's something that's very tactile and you can experiment very easily with. And because we're in the same building as our factory, um, that's very possible. And yeah, I'm very curious to understand what happens in that material and also to, to really sort of go deeper in understanding by doing these sorts of experiments. Um, this was a experiment to understand what happens within a material when you apply color. So you see at the very center of that diagram a clear uh, transparent block. So this was an experiment in seeing what happens when you add a little bit of white pigment into the mix and a little bit of black pigment into the mix when you go left and then saturating in color going all the way across. So you can really see yeah, what happens when you work with color in a material? It's not applied on top. Um, the depth plays a role in it. Um, it was, here you see the, the physical result of that. This was specifically for an installation uh, I recently did in the Vitra Design Museum, where we reorganized their beautiful design collection um, by color instead of chronologically. And then there were a lot of color studies by artists and designers um, like Le Corbusier, Hela um, and they, was, they sort of created their own color palettes that they always worked with. And this is sort of my interpretation of that. This is my color palette, even though, you know, I, I work with many more colors than, the, than this. But this is just exploring one color, but within the resin. You also really see that towards the back, it's the same set of samples, but it's polished and flip to the front, it's matte. So also that uh, material finish really impacts how you perceive color within a material. Um, yeah, this is one of the first projects I did with cast resin, the same material on the slide before. And this was trying to understand what happens when you take a single line of light and you run it through a material. So you can either dim the, color, the light or you can enhance it by letting it really be diffused through the material. And following on from that, I thought, okay, what was interesting in the, the lighting before was that there was a very clear difference between what happened when the light was outside of the material and when it was inside the material. But what if you create all those differences within the material? So this is when we started playing with uh, color gradients within one block. And you really see that then the line of light is all within one object but it's very different depending on where in the piece it is. So there you see that it has a lot of white pigment, which really blows the line out. And at the very top, it, it tints it very blue and makes it a very sharp line. So manipulating light through resin is uh, 
a reoccurring theme that I keep trying to explore. Here in a much more three-dimensional way. So again, a single line of light going through uh, volumes of resin, but because they're slightly staggered, you get these uh, alternating reflections so that you create these lights that are yeah, really to be experienced three-dimensionally. And depending on which side of the object you're viewing it from, it's very different. Uh, again, here, everything is resin, um, just applied in different ways within one volume. And depending on what angle you look at the object, it's either a very sort of smooth uh, fading of color or very sharp lines. And then because we're continuously working with the same material, it's always fun to try and scale it up. So this was a bathroom uh, commissioned by a private client. Um, I don't like to work or force materials onto uh, an application that they're not meant for. So this material is actually always used in, bath, in bathtubs, but in combination with fiberglass. Uh, and here we, we left that out and made this more solid volumes that then create the entire bathroom. Um, and it's really fun with, with more unique projects like this that you get to collaborate with other companies to try and you know, make it happen. So here we worked with a 3D robot printing company, which is also in the same building as our studio, to make the molds. And the client came to check the size of the bath. And then the installation is uh, it's, it's all collaborative together with the architects um, to try and yeah, do these unique projects. And not only myself, I, I am in very inspired by materials and uh, the projects occur through that inspiration, but I always find it really interesting that other people are then inspired by the results of that and try to mimic it in different materials. So this is um, a very famous Russian uh, pastry chef and he interpreted one of my uh, onyx and resin coffee tables into a, this beautiful cake. And he's done this actually for a few other designs as well. And I love that then this one project can take on a new life as something edible. So that was all the same material applied in different ways to create different effects. But on the flip side of that, I really like to play with the same form language as well and using different materials to really define the perception of that form. So this is a pattern for the tufting process of a rug I designed quite some years ago, where I really wanted to create a landscape um, that celebrates the perception of these individual tufts by creating um, yeah, an interior and an exterior rounding, uh, which then landed at us on, uh, on this donut shape or a torus shape. But you can really see that very small iterations give a very different effect. So with a center image, it almost looks like it's over-baked muffins. Um, and then on the right, it's much more graphic and two-dimensional. Um, and in the end, this was the, the final product. And then going on from this project, um, I was thinking, what if we do the same shape in resin again? Because within the process of creating all the design pieces in resin, you have to imagine that it starts as a liquid and then you add the color pigments and a hardener, which then sets off a chemical reaction and it hardens out. But it also shrinks a little bit. So you always want to have a little bit more than you really need. Um, and sometimes that little bit more is a little bit too much. So then you end up with a, a tiny bit of leftover resin at the bottom of the bucket that you've been pouring from. And I don't want anything to go to waste that I, I create, uh, also throughout the production process. So we've always been sort of throwing that in a bucket and then you get this layer cake of different colors of resin. So then following that, I thought, okay, this shape, it's really interesting. Is it something we can scale up and then it becomes more of a furniture piece that you can actually sit on? And then the poof was born. <laughs> This is a, um, a foam uh, volume, but because of the limitations of the production process, it's not able to have a complete void in the center. So you see it quite well in that image there that it sort of 
plateaus uh, just going down. And then it was coated in, um, in a, a rubber coating. This was for a, a fashion brand in Milan. And as with the pastry chef, this was an image I posted on Instagram and the founder of Hem, which is a furniture brand from Sweden, saw it and was like, hey, this is cool. Do you think we could maybe turn this into an upholstered version for Hem? And I thought about it and I was like, actually, that would be, yeah, really interesting. But under one non-negotiable condition, which is that it has no seams. Because I think that's, when you're working with such a pure shape, you know, the, the torus shape, it's, it's infinite. And that's what makes it special. It has an interior curve, but it also has an exterior curve. But it doesn't have a beginning or an end. And I think with upholstery, that's very tricky because you always need to, you need to loop that seam around. So then a two-year process was started to figure out how to upholster this shape without a seam. Um, and it ended up being a 3D knitted uh, fabric that sort of wraps into it as kind of a sock and is stuck together at the bottom of the object. And these objects kind of also have a life of their own and people love to sit in them, also animals like to sit in them. Um, and you see, again, that it has a very different aesthetic with this soft um, upholstered materiality. And then more recently, um, I launched a collection with IKEA, which is very Taurus heavy as well. But again, because of the material use, uh, the transparency or opacity, you experience that shape in many different ways. You can slice it in half, and then it has a void, uh, which then it becomes a vessel. Um, or it's slightly curved or pulled off the wall, which allows then for light to flow out of it and bounce off the wall. Or uh, it's the same shape, um, but it's illuminated from within, so it becomes a light again. And here are some other experiments we have done in the past for, uh, for a large-scale installation um, where you can yeah, also really understand how the sun plays a role in, in playing with that shape. Um, this is a test where part of the back has been sliced off so that you create this really interesting lens. So it's definitely not a shape that I'm done with experimenting yet. But then on to the next chapter, which is materiality activated by natural elements. Um, yeah, I did a project a few years ago with Fendi, um, which was a, a collection of fountains. And these objects, they really cannot exist without the, without the water. And was it going? Yes. Um, I think water was really the the main part of this project, that I wanted to try and control water um, by letting it flow over or sort of sit dormant, um, let bubbles run through the water, just all these different ways of activating a natural element. Um, and actually, you know, the, the materiality that it is interacting with is very similar to water. Um, it has the same transparency happening, um, but then it doesn't have that added element of motion that water has, which is also very complicated because it doesn't matter how many experiments you do prior to the final design, it's always gonna end up doing what it wants to do itself.
So that's a very glamorous video, um, but of course, to be able to make those sorts of designs, we do a lot of mock-ups that are not as glamorous. Um, yeah, this is really the only way that we can understand what we're designing, to, to make a lot of quick and dirty mock-ups. Um, just This is, for example, just two sheets of plexi stuck together, running a, a little pump I bought at an aquarium store um, to make it work. Actually, that whole project is kind of powered by the supplies of a local aquarium store. Um, so it's, it's fun to just think about how, yeah, these you know, seemingly quite glamorous projects are born out of very non-glamorous uh, scenarios and then can become very big installations as well. Um, Fendi requested after that first project um, oh, to create uh, some more of these fountains, but really scaled up. So yeah, this is uh, the, the logo again, with a very small amount of water actually, because it's really squeezed into only a few millimeters. Um, so that whole effect is happening just with a very limited amount of water and air going through it. Then um, also a few years ago, I was asked to create an installation at the Mies van der Rohe Barcelona Pavilion in Barcelona, which was a very daunting task because I have so much respect uh, for the design of this place. It's, it's perfect as is. It doesn't need any additional things. Um, so I really wanted to work with the site to inform what these objects should be. So I was really extracting the different architectural planes, uh, the marble, pulling it off the wall, uh, and taking the color with it, uh, then the, the travertine coming out of the ground and where the glass and the travertine would meet, you create this functioning object like a chaise long. But also water is really a very important part of this architecture. So I also wanted to extrude that um, through a glass fountain, which is really pulling the water up through these two sheets of glass and letting it overflow. So again, this would just be a very boring sheet of glass if it was just placed on top of the water. But because the water is interacting with it, you create a totality of, of the shape. Um, here are some images of the production and installation. And of course, the glass is also interacting with the water and the sun where the color is transformed or transferred onto the water and the ripples then distort that. So I'm always searching for that interconnection where all parts of the object or installation um, do something to the other. This is a picture from at my house at home um, where we have a glass table um, which has a specific size to it. But when the sun hits it, it becomes twice as big because it casts this color shadow. So I also really like that you can use the power of, of natural elements to enlarge the scale of, a, of an object. Um, and the experience also, obviously, because depending on what time of day, this color shadow moves around. So it's an ever-changing object, even though it's actually a very static object. But the sun really powers it. Um, and I use that same notion of, of working with a static, singular object, um, but having it really be very dynamic during the day at an installation in the 
solo house in Spain uh, in 2018. It was a commission for a watch company and they wanted something special to launch a new uh, timepiece. So I created this monolith and it was based in a perfectly circle or circular um, uh, architectural building. So for, it was kind of a no-brainer to sort of mimic the watch in that sense, but through a sundial. So as the day went on, you could tell the time by the shadow, but on the flip side, it also had this color reflection. And because the color on the monolith was different all around, that color also changes. I don't know if this video is gonna repeat exactly what I just said, but here's a... I think it's, it's quite interesting if you look back at where timekeeping originates from. It always started with the sun creating a shadow and civilization being able to understand time using the sun. I always start a project because there is a fascination for a certain material or a certain effect. These simple gestures of reflection and shadow, refraction, diffusion, it's all made possible simply because of the existence of light. So we have this amazing house that is a perfect circle and the idea of creating something related to a timepiece. The starting point for the watch is to do what the sun has originally been doing. I think it's quite a nice marriage of the architecture, the craftsmanship of the watch and the notion of time all sort of brought back to its core of where timekeeping comes from, which is the sundial. Never stand still. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I definitely always also try to build on past projects and the things I learned from past projects. So uh, after having done that sundial, um, many years later actually, because it was just last year, I was invited to make an installation in Riyadh. And there again, I really wanted to work with the natural surroundings. Um, it's, it was for a light festival and I think what's always really a shame about light festivals is that the focus is so much on artificial light. So they're kind of only interesting at night when there's no more sun. Whereas all these installations will still exist during the day as well. So why not try and harness the, the power of the sun during the day and then have artificial light powering it at night. So it's a 24 seven interesting installation. So for this um, project, I again, uh, created these monoliths, but they are all slightly rotated so that depending on, uh, well, the sun will hit it from one direction. You can see that you also get uh, the same shadows, but because of those different reflective angles, the, you get this myriad of reflections happening. So during the day, uh, the installation looks like this. They really feel like very solid mirrored uh, colored mirrored columns. But then in the evening, they're made out of two-way mirrors. So the way that that works is wherever there's more light, you see through it. So during the day, there's more light on the outside of the object. So you don't see through to the interior of the object. But in the evening, as the sun starts to set, you start to see that there's actually an interior light source as well which is even more also adding this glowing effect when the sun has really gone under. And yeah, I think I said it before, I always try to get more from a material than is already there. So this during the day starts to become a much bigger installation because of its reflections. But at night, it's also producing much more light because 
of the mirror surfaces. So there's only two lines of light inside each of these columns, but because the mirror surfaces, you, it's bouncing it around continuously. So you experience much more lines than there actually are. So you're multiplying the light actually. And then because of its surroundings, you're also making it much more than it is because it's reflecting in the water. Um, it's bouncing light off of the, the mountain. So this quite simple installation becomes much more than itself because of, its, uh, because of the site and, and everything that's happening around it. Here's a, a video that shows that transition a bit. Obviously, we get to what other powers natural elements could have um, when talking about these types of installations. This is one of the first solar cells ever produced, which is uh, filled with liquid, um, a silicon-based uh, oil to prevent the cells from oxidizing, which is really showing a lot about the power of materials again. And obviously, there's been a lot of technological developments uh, with solar panels and solar cells um, of recent years. But the way that they're incorporated into artistic installations, um, I think can use a bit more improvement. The thing that I find very, no offense to the designer of this, but this is definitely showing or imposing the aesthetics of a solar cell onto, a, um, onto an artistic installation where this for me is much more interesting. Um, these tiles are actually solar panels so that you're actually able to preserve um, traditional aesthetics. Um, there's a lot of technology going into creating transparent solar panels, so then you also don't need to be imposed by this um, solar cell aesthetic. And this is something that I'm very interested in to, to explore in my future projects, um, especially because solar panels are produced with laminated glass, which I work with a lot. Um, so the bottom piece is a, a project of mine. And then when you see the way that these cells are produced, it was, was kind of a no-brainer for me to, to dive into how can I work with solar cells in these sort of outdoor installations so that you create projects that are not just aesthetic, um, but that they're also you know, quietly um, generating electricity without screaming, I'm a solar panel, look at me. Um, so, yeah, fusing the world of what I've always been doing with this laminated glass and then solar panels. How can those two meet in an interesting way? So last year, um, I was asked by Audi to create a charging pole for the city of Amsterdam. And again, this was a, a commercial project. And I always like to, to use these commercial projects as pilots for other types of projects I'd like to do in the future. It was the same with Fendi. This is probably not something they want to hear, but it's, that was kind of the test to be able to create more fountains in the future. Um, and this for me was also really a test to create more hidden solar powered um, or hidden solar panel projects in the future. So, well, I can't go back, but um, the idea, thank you. <laughs> Actually, that entire top piece is solar panels. Um, but you don't need to know that unless I tell you that. And that's where I find is a lot of, of interesting potential. Um, 
The city of Amsterdam, which is what these charging poles were for, is built on a layer of sand, and that's really the foundation of the city. So I wanted to use the power of materials to create that project, which, you know, the foundation is sand, so the bottom volume of that charging pole is made from sand. Uh, using a process which has actually been used in the automotive industry already for some time to create elements uh, of their motor compartments. But now we're using it in a, yeah, in actually showing the process, the, the material instead of using it as a molding um, material. So the bottom of that pole is very sturdy and made from this 3D printed sand. And the top part is pulling the power of the sky back into that object, um, but in a, in a very subtle way. So here you see the, um, the connecting part of the solar cell is on the back, and it's a sandwich of glass and color, solar cell, um, but because of the way that the color is applied, the sun can still go directly through it and generate power. So yeah, this uh, for me is, is what the studio is really focusing on at the moment. How to challenge that idea of what a solar panel can look like and how it can be incorporated into artistic projects um, so that you can create products or installations that they're gonna be there anyway, um, but then at least they're not passive. They're st they're, they can always be working and, and generating electricity if they're outside. So harnessing the forces of nature, for me, is the future. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for listening.